relation between different types of social power towards democracy as a process of uh, decision make, making decision. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, important uh, to uh, stress that the, when we speak about social power, we have to, to be clear about this, uh, how it is structuralized. What is the structure? It's, it's very wide. What does it mean, actually? So, uh, we have to clearly the, uh, understand that the social power encompasses practically everything potential and real mm -hmm. in the society and in the personality what can influence the other uh, groups of the society. So, the relation between the democracy as a way to, to decision making in a society and different types of, of uh, existence of social power is uh, not equal. If we speak about social power, it's one thing one type of power is state power that includes the power of uh, mili military power. I only think in relation to democracy, what does it mean? Then the other, other uh, uh, information power, then uh, influence on, on general, etc. Then the other biggest is uh, s uh, power of the civil society. A type of social power out of state. What is the relation to the democracy and, and civil society? Then we have other other special uh, uh, special types. It it is, uh, uh, for example, among civil societies, uh, religion or faith as a power, social power, in relation to democracy. Then we have general knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge as a power, or information <coughs> as a social power, and technology as a, mm -hmm. it's not a, just a mean. Today, world special, it is a type of social power, regardless of who is using, how it's using. So, of course, for civil society, the decision making is uh, much more closer. Uh, with the democracy as a model of making decision, then, for example, uh, if you speak about uh, military power. Also, in religion, in, in faith, in religion, in churches, if we define the religion as a cultural inheritance, mm -hmm. cultural, cultural, cultural inheritance as a part of a culture. Of course, uh, it is also close to the democratic way of making decision when we speak from that side, despite the, usually the, the religious uh, organization and, and the church are probably the most hierarchically uh, organized, but also it depends on the, on the, on the faith. So, uh, I would like to stress uh, that uh, it is when you speak of social power, it is also connected with the identity, identity of the individual and identity of the groups. And uh, of course, we spoke about uh, rule of law, how the democracy as a way of making decision is going to be improved in, in each aspect of the social power. Thank you. The social power is not the novelty value and is not a modern invention. If we look into, again, history, we will discover that it was Aristotle who was writing about a human being, a man being a political animal. And it started all that because he was talking that it is exactly, it is not sort of, he was 
the man is not born with that, he acquires that with the ability to speak, because speech gives a possibility to differentiate the nuances between good and bad again. But anyway, social power today, um, uh, to certain reasons, I don't want to go into the details, is associated with a sort of undiscussable good. And I want to contest this opinion. Any revolution is a consolidation of social power. We talked about Robespierre terror, terror, and I want to remind you that the Place de la Concorde today in Paris was Place de la Révolution at that period of time, and there were roughly 20 public executions a day during the terror uh, time. And it was also social power at that time. The Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 did cost so many millions that even now uh, official statistics cannot provide the concrete details. And it was also social power. So social power, in fact, has existed always. And what is politics, if not a manipulation of people in order to consolidate social power? to the goals of, of different political groups. Now, uh, what uh, they believe today, it has become a sort of also truth in the last, uh, you know, po last possible truth, that civil society, NGOs, are definitely the embodiment of this progressive social power. Sorry, I have been working for social group, social society for 20 years, and I can tell you that this is not always the case, because everything depends on the people, on the leaders. I have seen many examples when one very famous uh, NGO, international NGO, was bending its, its uh, course, its uh, activities, in order to support one corporation against another corporation. I've seen a lot of examples when, for instance, on um, uh, GMO thing, people were also helping one corporation against another corporation, not even having the slightest idea what they are talking about in terms of the genetically uh, modified organisms. And I've seen many examples when uh, leaders of business were quite socially oriented. And all of that depends on a human being, only on the human being. So instrumentalization of that will never help. Education, culture is of a, uh, extreme importance if we want to change this situ situ situation. And uh, uh, finally, I wanted to stop very quickly on what Eric uh, mentioned about a redistribution of poverty. I must say that uh, uh, I would, uh, uh, first of all, I think that is not possible. Second, it is not uh, useful. Because uh, coming from Locke, to him, to whom Winston referred uh, uh, earlier, the right to the private property is considered to be the sacred right of human being. And more than that, even Locke was saying that if you refuse the right of property, pro uh, uh, property private property, that means that you refuse your own freedom and people will never accept that. So redistribution is, uh, I would say, very unfortunate uh, sort of instrument to change the situation. It's rather triggered a lot of um, uh, disasters uh, in, in the future, in my uh, humble, like they write now on the internet, IMHO, 
Okay. Okay. Use the help. Okay. I I refer uh, first of all to uh, what Winston said about democracy that has to be based on responsibility, accountability, and transparency. And so. Uh, let's assume that uh, really we want to, uh, uh, to build a democracy or, or just uh, even better, a human-centered democracy, okay? Because uh, today I think that we have to speak about human-centered democracy, not just democracy. And do we have the right tools to achieve that goal? And so uh, from a technological point of view, I was waiting for a, a magic word but I never heard about it yet, and that magic word is crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is a wonderful experiment to give people the capacity to give their opinion on specific topics. And then it was a great experiment that started about 10 years ago, then was followed by air mapping project at European level. Air mapping, I don't know if you are aware of that, about earth mapping project at the European level. That was a project to map the, uh, the whole earth by using young people, secondary level students. <coughs> and they did that. Each one of, that, uh, of them was just a mapper, uh, an earth mapper. They just give instruction to become an earth mapper. <coughs> and each one of them just mapped his surroundings, or her surroundings. And now they built all, you know, the map, the heart map, at, at, with the, at, uh, 30 meters resolution. And you can have that kind of, uh, of information for free. But that, this is just another experiment of how can you can use uh, people to get the real information that you need if you want to build a human-centered democracy. We have the technology, we have the means, we have the young people that are able to use the, those technologies. And so I think that if we want to real human-centered democracy, it's just a matter of, cho of our choice. Otherwise, we are just playing with words. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And now, Papa. Um, let me concretize a discussion and by going to the bottom. In anthropology, in order to obtain a doctorate, you have to uh, conduct, the graduate student has to conduct at least a year <coughs> in an engaged field research where they live in the community they study to gather data, then go back and with their supervisors write their research. So there was, I was at UCLA at the time, and a graduate student came to me and said, I want to discuss the possibilities of a dissertation research. Uh, where are you from? I'm from South Korea. Uh, my name is Karen Cho. And um, so where specifically do you come from? I come from Sheju Island in South Korea. What is it? She, she said it's a diving village. OK. What do they do in the village? She said, well, it's diving, diving for livelihood. I said, so who does the diving? She said, the women. I said, uh, only the women? Yes, only the women. Do they dive when they have their monthly periods? Oh, yes. Do they dive when they are pregnant? Oh, yes, throughout pregnancy. Do they dive when they have a baby? Well, they take a little break, and then they have a baby. And after they have the baby, they dive. The mothers or a friend or a sister would hold the baby. The woman would come back to land, to nurse the baby, and then go down and dive. I said, so what do you do with the harvest? That we take it to, I mean, they take it to the market. I said, well, ah, there now. Who takes it to the market? The women. Who sells it? The women. Who cooks? The women. Who raises the children? The women. I said, I'm very curious now. What do the men do? <laughs> you do have men, don't you? She said, yes. They sit under a big tree discussing power. <laughs> I said, there's your dissertation. A year later, she came back and she said, they managed to have ancestor worship ritual, which is totally controlled by the men. The women are not allowed to have ancestor worship. And they still sit under the tree and discuss power. 
and the women are still running the economy at the time, in the 70s. But South Korea is now in the news. I thought I'd bring in some real people. Thank you. I think this is the best topic to illustrate how things which we used to use are not valid anymore. Even what we consider today shouldn't be valid tomorrow. This is an extremely good topic. Social power used to exist in the past, but it tremendously changed. Basically, it used to be conflict between social power and leaders, and leaders used to rule. Social, social power was out. Now we have situation when leaders are among social power. They will use Twitter to, in fact, produce a social power. And uh, I've heard many discussing social power and humans. What would be social power if it's not to humans? To environment? Might be, if we consider human part of environment. The problem with social power today is basically it is technology. What? It is technology. It is practiced through technology. Technology has own rules, so social power has own rules. You can find many articles and many statistics the social power is not a universal power. It has been very limited and circulated to certain circles of people. So talking about the social power as universal <coughs> is very dubious. Mm -hmm. It is social power of group of the people. And the thing is how this social power is conflicted with the people and with the leaders. <laughs> Social power is not generally democratic. It's much more than democracy, much more. It, is, uh, it has become a sort of ruling uh, with the people. Ruling with not with the plebs, sorry, to say plebs, but with all people, with all humans. It's completely changed. Basically, it has effects to democracy, but basically it is not a democratic, democratic issue. How can it be a democratic issue when it is not possible in today's civilization having a different access to technology to produce the same impact. So, uh, the question really is, how we control social power and can be regulated? Up to now, it has been shown it's not possible. I believe that this is just transition uh, time, that we are going soon, very soon, sooner than we think to be a society without political parties, unless we destroy a society which would be in protocols and in institutions. And then it's a big question, what's social power in such a society? We can discuss social power in the contemporary world and in the past, but in the future, what would be social power with 10 billion people? Not possible. 10 billion people has to be organized in a completely different way. I would say, I would be brave to say, without social power, so that's uh, one issue. Another, I want just to uh, say a few words on economy. economy. Economy is everything and nothing. Sorry to say this, Harry. Certainly, when it's everything, you can have issues concerning democracy and so on. But just take uh, the biggest economy is stock market. It has nothing to do with democracy. So uh, taking a case of properties and economy issues as a basic for democratic society, I think it is a bit dangerous, uh, considering what is the economy today. Thank you, Mobir. So, um, a democracy should balance and distribute the social power, but how can that happen? That can happen by boosting social mobility, and how do we boost social mobility? Simply by making the rich pay taxes and you invest those money in order to ameliorate the condition of poor people and especially in the education system. If you are able to grant for everybody a good quality education system, also people coming from lower social classes <coughs> will be able to gain more social power and that is a way you redistribute it. So, Something that really drives me crazy about the United States are also the student debt. I have so many friends that are still paying like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of student debts. 
and it seems like we will not be able to pay all of those money in the future, and they are really struggling to succeed in life because of this. So make the rich pay taxes and invest those money in the education system. Thank you. Big. <laughs> okay. Uh, now right. This is a great topic. I would like to, to focus on just on, on, on one issue uh, <coughs> raised by uh, Eric. Uh, social power over uh, ownership of resources uh, versus uh, social power or control. Uh, on the resource uh, allocation. I, I think that uh, we discussed today, uh, I mean, from today's perspective, when uh, Moby raised the issue of technology, it looks like outdated uh, uh, concept, you know, uh, where the resources, natural resources, that might Manufactured capital or natural capital uh, finance are located when we have uh, new sources of power and like social media, the network, and uh, artificial intelligence. We didn't talk about that. And then uh, how to control this. But coming back to the traditional issue. And then I to make the, the final argument for this. I remember as uh, five, six years ago, a town meeting in my village, when the activist came from the town and brought all farmers and say, well, we have to organize a collective farm here in, in my village, nearby Lublin. And since my grandfather was the the richest, the best, you know, was hard working and learning, the investing in his knowledge. Farmer, they approach him, Leo, will you join our collective farm? Uh, it was the year uh, 51 or 50, 1950. And he said, well, I still remember this because it was uh, in the uh, I mean, uh, uh, beginning of studying. And he said, guys, your model of the farm, collective farm, sounds great to me. And as you know, we are working very hard in our family. This is why we are performing well. I will join your farm, but after harvest, if you will show that you are harvesting better, I don't want to lose. But of course, they got bankrupt before harvest. <laughs> so, and I exper we experienced, you know, 40 years, in, uh, 45 years in Poland, uh, the attempts in many Central East uh, European countries, the state intervention and, uh, in uh, ownership and uh, resource allocation. This is not the area what we should mm. exercise mm. the power. This is the area for managers, for professionals. So here, we should write the regulations to, to have the limits, you know, how to use. And the one of the things we should need, because there are public goods, social, uh, common goods, collective goods, we need to regulate the income coming from the resources, from pauper. This is the area of uh, governmental uh, regulation, not the resource allocation, because managers are uh, responsive, they are educated for this, to make an efficient <coughs> allocation of resources. So, in terms of the, the new media, I mean, they, they produce the value, they need to, and then the, the government, the public, as you see, you know, they were lazy, they did not regulate right, you know. This is why we had this uh, financial crisis. We didn't, we didn't have transparency, we didn't have uh, clear uh, limits of uh, funding the, the, the party, so the, the, the resource, uh, you know, the incomes jumped, you know, the managers, you know, without any control. You know. 
So anyway, uh, so let's uh, leave the government the regulations of the income, uh, uh, the, but in the fair way, you know, transparent and effective and uh, uh, effective resource allocation leave to uh, the uh, professionals. And then we need to define how we, who owns the money. <coughs> And we need to go. This is the, the, the new issue. Who owns the artificial intelligence capital? Is new type of capital. Who gains the benefits? Is this tax? And how does influence you know the the, the public in terms of making decisions? And so we, we have too many fake news. We have too many stolen election or biased election uh, or what. And so these are the major issues to, to discuss. Coming back, you know, to the old days, you know, I, I, it doesn't make sense. I think that, you know, keep work for professionals in resource allocation, keep go, uh, the, the role of the government to have professional people to regulate the economy in an effective, effective and efficient way. Thank you, Thank you government. Thank you, speaker. We have in November, of 2016, two years ago, more or less, we had a beautiful seminar here. Uh, it was on the second floor uh, on social power, and that seminar was was very interesting and and uh, very productive. And we had uh, a, a clear we, we we reached the end of the seminar with, with a clear view what was social power, and I think we should recover a little bit those ideas to, uh, in fact, give some light on this relationship between democracy and social power. What did uh, we conclude at the time? Social power, in fact, uh, was the power that was embedded in social structures. That was, in fact, what we said. And any society of people, of humans, any society self-organized. Self-organizes, well, it gets its own organization according to time, size, location, whatsoever. And creates structures, of course, because power is based on consent. Someone's consent on the power of others. This is the basic relation of power. And uh, society then, you know, uh, self-organization, is based on the creation of structure. And then we have, in fact, four types of, of, um, of, uh, of institutions, uh, societal institutions. Formal structures, military, government, law, etc. Organized activities, political, economical, cultural, etc. Informal institutions, values, customs, way of life. And social potential, which is in fact also <coughs> it's part of the informal institutions, aspirations, perception, and so on. So, where is the place in this very general scheme? Where is the place of democratic values? Right? The place is in fact in the formal structures. Yes, I mean the military have to be submitted to civil power, for instance. That's uh, that's very important. The government, government must respond to an assembly which uh, is made of the people or represents the people. Law, the constitution. Okay, very good. Uh, in terms of activities, political, economical, economic, cultural. In political activities, we can have democratic values, right? Duties and rights and things like that. And, the exercise of citizenship. In economic activities, where are democratic values? Well, there we can we can really uh, wonder very much on where are the democratic values in economic activities as such. Cultural, well, in culture we can have some some values that relate to democratic. But in informal institutions, in customs, values, I mean, we, we, our societies are based on, on the family. On fa is family democratic? 
uh, I mean, we can still we see, uh, <coughs> in fact, the parents uh, uh, instructing the, their children, well, some of them, at least, in what is the functioning of democracy, the values of, of freedom, of equality, of solidarity, all, all this. But the basic functioning of the family is not really based on, uh, you know, a democratic decision-making. <coughs> So this is just to say that, uh, in fact, democracy is really vested in the political aspects of society, as we have already discussed here. So if when you have the primacy of the political, you can have a, re a real connection with the democratic values. When you have the primacy of the economic, well, that's not forget about it, but that's our problem. When we have the primacy of, and finance for instance, which is basically mm -hmm. anti-democratic, then if we get the primacy of finance uh, with the financialization of the entire economy and so on, then we are posed for a problem in terms of this relationship between democracy and social power. I think this is in fact one of the, 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 the dimensions that we have really to, to, to announce. Thank you. Natalia? Thank you. <clears throat> the subject is very wide. We have been talking to now about cultural heritage, about NGOs, etc., etc. I, I would rather give you my own, it's a, for me, quite unusual experience. Talking about cultural heritage, yeah? I was on business trip last November. Before or after, I don't remember. I was in Cyprus. I had uh, this channel, but still I decided I need at least one day to see the country. And my idea was to go to Olympia. But I haven't done any pre-arrangement, so I just called to my hotel. They said, OK, there are some Russian agencies. They are organizing the trip. Well, it's very sensitive subject for me. You probably know my best friend was killed there, etc., etc. So. I said, okay, I will, be, I will go with them on the bus, 10 people, Russians, myself. Uh, sounds good, I speak Russian, like I'm completely bilingual. My native is Ukrainian, but I am like a parrot. Whenever I would be with Russians, I would, like, in Moscow they speak one language, in Voronezh the other, but I would just immediately, as I would say, no, you're not from Moscow, you're from Voronezh. No, <laughs> so it's funny. So I just, I was quiet, but they thought I, I'm Russian. So I was, uh, a bit nervous, but we haven't touched any sensitive subjects. Everything went it was fast. And then, uh, during lunch time, I was sitting with a very nice. I noticed among those people there was a very nice, intelligent, nice looking girl like Sivana. Only blonde. Only blonde. <laughs> and I know, we were just <laughs> We were sitting next to each other during lunch time, and she started saying the word. It was funny. You know, Natalia, I'm really impressed by the people here in the bus. Nobody drinks. Everybody is flat. Nobody just thinks it's a good. Yes, true. So I was recently in San Baikal, and there was a girl. She couldn't stay without drinking alcohol for half an hour. OK. <laughs> I'm still not saying that I'm not from Russia. <laughs> so we are discussing different subjects. And she's really, and I ask, where are you from? Moscow? From, from your parents were like scientists, teachers, or professors, like from, and uh, she is a banker. She works for bank. She is PhD. Here I became really interested. I said, "What is your subject?" She said, "You know, Natalia, I was. Um, it was not successful. I, I wrote a, a thesis. It was about civil society. And when I went to to defend it." I just, my conclusion was there is no civil society in Russia. No social power. So this is the biggest problem. And then I was, I was, how to say, confident enough as well. In fact, I'm not from Russia, I'm from Ukraine. And I feel sorry for your young generation because I'm mm -hmm. not really sorry. And uh, we even exchange our, we have been in Facebook together. And uh, so in that, I, you were saying goodbye to each other. And uh, she said, Natalia, I said, what, I said, what are you planning to do? She said, okay, I will be in bank, earning my money, 
promoting my career, but then probably I will learn the fluent English, I will go somewhere. So maybe I don't know. Maybe it will change. I said, well, probably it will change, said Finnish. I said, Tanya, but it will probably take another 30 years. What I'm trying to say is that social power in state, and you know, here is Kafa, right? From very close to Soviet Union <laughs> myself and Alexander, who is in Geneva now, yeah? So we are. Alexander is extremely co uh, close because he was in the Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was completely different from, from the Communist Party. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that in post USSR countries and in Ukraine, of course, it's a crucial problem. We do not have public service. Our Soviet system collapsed. Yeah. No, well, no state when somebody is asking, but the state should care. Where do you see state? Can I see? And I know most of that, right, from the top. Where do you see it? And I, sometimes I just feel sorry for that, because what they can do if, if on the level of a new dose, on village, on rayon, you, you go and see Soviet judge who wants money, right? He doesn't care about your democracy, your transparency, come on. You're supposed to pay him money for a piece of land because you want to produce some products, right? And because there is moratorium on land, you can do it officially. So you go to prosecutor or to militia, or the judge and pay money so he would believe in this. Till the, the guy needs some more money. So the social power and social civil society in, in uh, Ukraine and in, I think in Georgia is the same. Am I right? means, I mean, it's crucial that we would be united, but not by some um, controversial things, but some something which, which unites us, because everybody cares about how they keep educated. The lady from the Ukraine mentioned the civil society. Well, it's not a trivial concept. It's actually one of the most important foundations of the rule of law. Uh, law regulates courts, legislatures, executives, administrative agencies. But one of the most important dimensions of law, it protects the zone of civil society. Now you can't get power organized unless you have some framework that provides you with protection. Now I looked at several different societies on this question of the role of NGOs who promote democracy, transparency and so on. Mm. And what I discovered that emerging is that if these organizations accepted money from any outside source like the European Union or whatever, there had to be an immediate uh, 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 reporting to the government, they had to be investigated, and there were absolute limits as to what they could accept. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's a growing phenomenon in many authoritarian states. Yes. To prevent uh, democracy from taking roots, you want to strangle the... The, not, the NGOs that are committed to a democratic uh, outlook. Uh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Uh, at twelve thirty, we have a reception uh, downstairs with Nada. So please, uh, people, cooperate uh, to end on time. Go I, ahead. Then. I, I got your message. Uh, <laughs> now, now the, the so, so that's just one aspect that we have not had an adequate uh, understanding of the role of law and the fundamental importance of carving out a zone of civil society in which the role of the state is limited. They can have a role, but it can't be a repressive, uh, anti-democratic, uh, 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 repressive role. Uh, the second is that, obviously, there's an immense amount of complexity of trying to figure out who the participators are in social power, how they interrelate with each other, and these go to the very fundamentals, the nature of the family. Is the family reproducing democratic types, fascist types, male chauvinist types, female chauvinist types? What types of people are reproduced from this micro-social unit so central to just about any uh, social organization? Uh, I suggested, and Alberto and I still, uh, that, that we, we have to attempt to develop a, a way of of uh, mapping 
all these different components and the extent to which they interrelate with each other, influence each other and so on, and emerge uh, with a, a, a dispensation, ideological, uh, political, economic, that, that looks toward the best ideas that reproduce the best of society in terms of the best that democracy can produce. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Alif, Jerome, you are after <laughs> Gary. And then we close. <laughs> be more powerful. I would like to combine ethics with governance. Uh, there are there could be different definitions, but let's define ethics as rules how people agree to live. And governance uh, is a process of rule how what governments do to their citizens. So government is an institution, but governance is a process of rule. And ethical rules, the generally accepted uh, common rules how we want to live together. So to combine these two, what we can do is, because there are serious differences between individual good and social good, we are all selfish, uh, we carry these uh, selfish genes with us. So how we can combine these two, we need, I think, as all of us agree, education, science, culture and communication, and I agree with Nomi, because in the communication part, if we can use a common language like English, and if we know how to use information technologies, this is called the end of geography, not necessarily physically we need to be together, but we can use, combine our uh, intellectual capacity to, uh, to have better rules, at least at international level. One of our participants in the early session said, how our uh, global agreements can be more efficient. I think this is the way of doing this. And just I will uh, finish with one short story. There is a satirical book novel written by a very uh, intellectual uh, novelist, Israeli novelist, Abraham Kishon. The name is The Fox in the Chicken Coop. <laughs> and there is a very experienced politician had a heart attack, and the medical physician told him that you need to stop politics, politi uh, political life, go and live in a peaceful environment. And his assistant finds a very small village, every isolated from the rest of the world. They live happily, no leader, no rules, no bureaucracy, no red tape. And then he went uh, to this village, and they start to live there happily. And then, of course, he's a politician. Then he starts asking them, who is your leader? They reply, we, we, they reply, we don't have any leader. We don't want any leader. And then after a while, he convinced his hairdresser to be a leader of the society. They need a leader. Then they bought a nice big horse for him. Then he started to ride the horse. And everyone looked at him higher than us, a big authority. It could be a nice to be a leader. Then the story starts, they set up institutions, and they create bureaucracy, they create red tape, everyone started to compete with each other. This uh, small heaven transformed into a hell by an experienced politician. So we need some rules, but of course, we must be aware of our social capital and power. Thank you, Gary. Social power is energy. It's the capacity for the accomplishment in the society. Whether that power leads to accomplishment for the benefit of everyone or accomplishment for a very few uh, is, depends on the values and the organization or institutions through which it's uh, channeled. And that's, uh, it's very interesting because our discussion of democracy now has really permeated to the values by which the society is governed in the widest sense, not just in the narrow sense of how people are elected. I think, uh, uh, and it's been mentioned that power is of many types. Education is a power, technology is a power. All of these can empower, or all of these can be used to deprive, to oppress. To oppress. Uh, I think the idea has come out, maybe not very clearly, that power is shifting. Uh, is power is shifted from the military, to the political system. Now it has shifted to uh, money, where it seems to be a, a real center, an independent, autonomous center of power. Of course, 
to a lesser degree, it shifted to civil society, both domestically and internationally. And I think Winston's point uh, this morning was it's ultimately, its ultimate destination is the individual. Uh, and we, the individuals today are far more empowered than, they have, than we have been at any time in history. We're empowered by the education we get, the knowledge we have access to. We're empowered by technologies, uh, the internet. Uh, we're empowered in many ways, though everything is relative. Uh, I wanted to just close with a couple of things. One of the conclusions we had at the previous uh, meeting on this was that uh, a kind of a theorem to be the wider the distribution of the power, the greater the overall power to society. When all the power was with a monarch, to take an extreme case, or a military, the actual power of the society was quite limited because power means releasing the energy and utilizing the capabilities of everybody and there's only so much you can do when you're doing it through force and compulsion. Whereas when everybody is motivated to do something productively or constructively, the creativity and dynamism and vitality of the society is much greater. So distribution, but of course also by values. I just wanted to close with uh, uh, just, I think we need a little more clarity. I, I, know, I, I think I understood what Eric was saying about the distribution, and I understand where you and Grazna were bigger coming. But I think, look, uh, let's not, if you, we leave to shift the discussion from property to money, money power, how it's generated and how it's utilized, it's com it is, there are many things that can be done are fully compatible with democracy and market economies yeah. that don't deprive people of the fundamental uh, right to property. Uh, we can ban speculation, for example. Exactly. Uh, we can ban, uh, we can insist on more reasonable tax rates. Uh, we can ban corruption and, and st mm. so I, I think we need to separate these yeah. two. You don't have to deprive people of the right to property and yeah. still redistribute the money power in a way that's much more beneficial to the society. Thank you. Jerome, the last.
to live, to, to, uh, to, see, to, to, go out, to escape from a trap. And we are in the trap. This trap has a name in the, you know, in the, you know, the, the slang of the geopoliticians. It's the Thucydides trap. The, we are in the new Thucydides trap. You see, on the 16th situation of Thucydides trap, you see, uh, 11 or 12 resulted in war. So we should plan, you see, I'm going to stop with that, but we should try to think a forward looking democracy because the future, the democracy has no future. No future was the motto of the parent movement, I remember we were singing no future. So the present forms of democracy, of so called democracy, have no future, of course. So we need to invent a new forward looking democracy to address the global issues, not only climate change, biodiversity, and so on, poverty, exclusion. And we are, and we think about technology, Techn we, we are going to, to move forward a world of robots, and of, and of artificial intelligence. It means you see, there, are, there will be the new slaves. We are already uh, here and there, the new slaves. Yeah, the slaves, it's a paradox, were managing Athens. It was not said. You see, they, they were excluded, maybe, from the political, the, the, the citizens were discussing the Agora, but who was managing the city? The slaves. They were the enarchs, as we say in France, of, you know, they were the, the high civil servants of Athens were managing the city. This was completely forgotten. So, we, the robots, just to, to, to conclude, I remember a, a famous article of Bill Joy, and he said, do, will the future still need us when you have all the technological revolution, the connection between robotics, you see nanotechnology, biotechnology, maybe one day the you know, yeah. robots will say that billions of people are useless and should be deleted as you delete an email. Thank you. <laughs> 60 seconds for Eric. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I will make uh, four very short comments. The first yeah. one concerns Alexander. Uh, in the uh, main framework of my arguments, which concerns market economy and democracy, private property should not be abolished. It should not be abolished because one of the main failures of socialism was state property. They took out every power of the population because they took out the private property. I fully agree we, can, we have to come more from below and not from above. Exactly. And regulation is a very powerful instrument to do, but it might have uh, not enough uh, power, but regulation is uh, an important device to come from below and not from above. A final comment to the question of democratic values and uh, the relation to the economy. I think that we should uh, go to the equivalence of political power and economic power and not have a hierarchy. We have in the 60s, 70s uh, a discussion that political power can dominate economic power. I think to a certain extent, but not fully. So political no. power has not... No. It's now, and yeah. now you're 60 seconds that are well past. It's 58 seconds. But no, you cannot have it. Otherwise, we, you know, okay, so you. people, we close in this session, but there are more. We talk about important reality, dealt a little less with meta reality, which probably would help us more to handle reality. And the reality is they are waiting downstairs for us. Uh, thank you. One moment, please. One moment, please. One moment, please. One moment, please. Just one moment, then I'll let you go. Uh, Nada Brewer, who is the director of IUC,
is hosting a reception for us downstairs right now, uh, including, I believe, some champagne or wine. So please come down, let her introduce herself, talk to us a few minutes, and we have lunch together. Thank you. Uh, we can